They put them between fresh, clean, laundered sheets, and there was always a newly squeezed glass of thick orange juice on the table under the dim pink lamp. All Charles had to do was call, and Mum or Dad would stick their heads into his room to see how sick he was. The acoustics of the room were fine. You could hear the toilet gargling its porcelain throat of mornings. You could hear rain tap the roof, or slime mice run in the secret walls, or the canary singing in its cage downstairs. If you were very alert, sickness wasn't too bad. He was thirteen, Charles was. It was mid-September, with the land beginning to burn with autumn. He lay on the bed for three days before the terror overcame him. His hand began to change, his right hand. He looked at it, and it was hot and sweating there on the counterpane alone. It fluttered, it moved a bit. Then it lay there, changing color. That afternoon the doctor came again and tapped his thin chest like a little drum. How are you? asked the doctor, smiling. I know, don't tell me. My cold is fine, doctor, but I feel awful. Ha, <laughs> ha! He laughed at his own oft-repeated joke. Charles lay there, and for him that terrible and ancient jest was becoming a reality. The joke fixed itself in his mind. His mind touched and drew away from it in a pale terror. The doctor did not know how cruel he was with his jokes. Doctor, whispered Charles, lying flat and colorless, my hand, it, it doesn't belong to me any more. This morning it changed into something else. I want you to change it back, doctor, doctor. The doctor showed his teeth and patted his hands. It looks fine to me, son. You just had a little fever dream. But it changed, doctor. Oh, doctor, cried Charles pitifully, holding up his pale, wild hand. It did. The doctor winked. I'll give you a pink pill for that. He popped a tablet onto Charles' tongue. Swallow. Will it make my hand change back and become me again? Yes, yes, yes. The house was silent when the doctor drove off down the road in his car under the quiet blue September sky. A clock ticked far below in the kitchen world. Charles lay looking at his hand. It did not change back. It was still something else. The wind blew outside. Leaves fell against the cool window. At four o'clock his other hand changed. It seemed almost to become a fever. It pulsed and shifted cell by cell. It beat like a warm heart. The fingernails turned blue and then red. It took about an hour for it to change, and when it was finished, it looked just like any ordinary hand. But it was not ordinary. It no longer was him any more. He lay in a fascinated horror and then fell into an exhausted sleep. Mother brought the soup up at six. He wouldn't touch it. I haven't any hands, he said, eyes shut. Your hands are perfectly good, said Mother. No, he wailed. My hands are gone. I feel like I have stumps. Oh, Mama, Mama, hold me, hold me. I'm scared. She had to feed him herself. Mama, he said, get the doctor, please, again. I'm so sick. The doctor will be here tonight at eight, she said, and went out. At seven, with night dark and close around the house, Charles was sitting up in bed when he felt the thing happening to first one leg and then the other. Mama, come quick, he screamed. Well, well, I'll, I'll have to give you three more pills, one for each limb, eh, my little peach? Laughed the doctor. Is it a germ that lives and has more little germs in me? Yes, I guess I know a certain fever when I see one, said the doctor, checking the boy's pulse with cool authority. Charles lay there, not speaking, until the doctor was crisply packing his black kit. And then in the silent room, the boy's voice made a small, weak pattern, his eyes alight with remembrance. I read a book once uh, about petrified trees, wood turning to stone, about 
about how trees fell and rotted and minerals got in and built up and and they look just like trees, but they're not. They're stone. He stopped. In the quiet, warm room, his breathing sounded. Well? asked the doctor. I've been thinking, said Charles after a time. Do germs ever get big? I, I mean, in biology class, they told us about one-celled animals, amoebas and things and how millions of years ago they got together until there was a bunch, and they made the first body. Take over a person? He screamed. The hands were on his neck. The doctor moved forward, shouting. At nine o'clock, the doctor was escorted out to his car by the mother and father, who handed him his bag. They conversed in the cool night wind for a few minutes. Just be sure his hands are kept strapped to his legs, said the doctor. I don't want him hurting himself. Will he be all right, doctor? The mother held to his arm a moment. He patted her shoulder. Haven't I been your family physician for thirty years? It's the fever. He imagines things. But those bruises on his throat, he, he almost choked himself. Just you keep him strapped. He'll be all right in the morning. The car moved off down the dark September road. At three in the morning, Charles was still awake in his small black room. The bed was damp under his head and his back. He was very warm. Now he no longer had any arms or legs, and his body was beginning to change. He did not move on the bed, but looked at the vast blank ceiling space with insane concentration. For a while he had screamed and, and thrashed, but now he was weak and hoarse from it, and his mother had gotten up a number of times to soothe his brow with a wet towel. Now he was silent, his hands strapped to his legs. He felt the walls of his body change, the organs shift, the lungs catch fire like burning bellows of pink alcohol. The room was lighted up as with the flickerings of a hearth. Now he had no body. It was all gone. It was under him, but it was filled with a vast pulse of some burning, lethargic drug. It was as if a guillotine had neatly lopped off his head, and his head lay shining on a midnight pillow, while the body, below still alive, belonged to somebody else. The disease had eaten his body, and from the eating had reproduced itself in feverish duplicate. There were the little hand hairs and the fingernails and the scars and the, and the toenails and the tiny mole on his right hip, all done again in perfect fashion. What's the name you called me? What? <laughs> the doctor puzzled. I, oh, the boy said. That was a long time ago. A long time ago. They all laughed, and while they were laughing, the the quiet boy moved his bare foot on the sidewalk and merely touched brush against a number of red ants that were scurrying about on the sidewalk. Goodbye! And the doctor drove away, waving. The boy walked ahead of his parents. As he walked, he looked away toward the town and began to hum school days under his breath. It's good to have him well again, said the father. Listen to him. He's so looking forward to school. The boy turned quietly. He gave each of his parents a crushing hug. In the parlor, before the others entered, he quickly opened the birdcage, thrust his hand in, and petted the yellow canary once. Then he shut the cage door, stood back, and waited. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.